Um, Thank you, you so much, Paul. You, That's think, very kind of you. I think uh, uh, our dog got jealous. Without a joke, yeah. he uh, just jumped Obi, onto the chair. No, Obi this way, got this offended, way. so he just sees like, hey, what about me? <laughs> and he just jumped God, behind God. on the chair. You know what? I, I, wish, I wish people were like dogs in some way. Where <laughs> oh, my goodness. Love. All they want to do is love you. That's it. That's that's how the world should be right now. I, I yeah. could not yeah. agree more. That that's perfect, Paul. Well, thank Sorry. you so much for the for the kind introduction. Um, um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, spending your evening with us. We're really appreciative. Uh, I hope you're all doing very well. Welcome to our kitchen. We're actually uh, this is our kitchen. Um, uh, we're going to be having dinner very soon. Very excited to be here and talk about something that we're all passionate about health and specifically brain health. Yeah. And I'll let Dean actually take the, the stand now. Yeah, so um, the brain is what we talk about. The brain is what we've been working on for the last 17 years. In fact, uh, some of you might know the story. Aisha and I met uh, 18 years ago in Afghanistan when I went back with uh, Tommy Thompson and the forces to help rebuild the country. Um, I was asked to become deputy minister and rebuild the country. And Aisha went back with Doctors Without Borders. And we met there in a party where she came and sat next to me and wooed me. But uh, <laughs> that's a different story, we, my, my version. That's his version, OK? Yeah. I'll tell you the real version uh, later. You know, uh, yeah, so um, uh, let's do the other version where, where you can see everybody. Yeah, uh, that would be great. Because I want to, this is such a beautiful community. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, um, and, and our first conversation was about our, our grandparents. Um, her grandfather and grandmother died of Alzheimer's and my grandfather and grandmother died of Alzheimer's on, on separate sides, a uh, very early age. And, and it was a, a remarkable um, how these amazing human beings, you know, lost bits and pieces of themselves. So, although prior to going there, I was actually, a neurologist already from Georgetown, and I was doing uh, um, some really interesting work at NIH, uh, Building 10, which is the wonkiest place in the planet, uh, doing unusual research, and then ended up in Afghanistan. We decided to go back, and the first place we went to was uh, UCSD, which was the number one neuroscience program at, in, the, in the world at the time. We worked on interesting uh, research on fMRIs, which looks at the brain while it's functioning, and on clinical trials and all those kind of things. But then after a couple of years, we became quite disillusioned and realized that this, this approach, although it's necessary, we're not the kind of doctors that throws the baby with the bathwater. We think healthcare system is important. We think clinical research is important. We think that basic research is important, but there was nothing being done for prevention. And that was a huge loss. Right. There was not, uh, because we knew that for heart disease, there was uh, already work being done by um, Dr. Esselstein and others that showed that you can actually prevent uh, for diabetes, but for for brain health, nothing. So we again decided to take the le path less traveled and went to um, uh, um, uh, you, you know uh, Loma Linda to study prevention, and that's where everything started. But the brain itself is the most important organ because it is who we are. It is what makes us who we are. You can replace other body parts, but you can't replace the brain because if you replace the brain, then you are that, that other person. The brain is also the most important organ because it's three pounds. Can you give me that brain? We have a little, yes. we have a- We carry our brain models everywhere. Yeah. As you can brain. see, there's one Here, in the kitchen. Here's too. a brain. This is actually heavier than three pounds, but a brain is three pounds, 2% of our body's weight, but it consumes 25% of body's energy and at times 50% of its oxygen. Something that's 2% doing all that continuously, even while we sleep. In fact, the whole purpose of sleep is because of the brain, to give brain capacity to rejuvenate, rebuild, and cleanse itself. Can I see it? <clears throat> so um, it's, it's the fastest growing organ at any one time. We hear the fact that the brain is the fast growing organ, but we take it in the context of childhood. No, even when we're adults, it's changing faster than any other uh, uh, organ you can imagine. Billions of neurons connecting and disconnecting and reconnecting. It's the most vascular organ in the body. By far, it's the most vascular organ. Um, and in fact, there are pictures of the brain when they've denuded the brain of all the other tissue and all that's left is the uh, vasculature. And all you see is veins and arteries. So where is room for anything else? It has 87 billion neurons and 10 times that number of glial or supporting cells. 
it is uh, also um, uh, the organ that consumes the most efficient source of energy. This should give you a clue. The most efficient source of energy for the brain is glucose, not ketones, glucose. And, and it's, it's also one of the most um, resilient organs because when it is damaged, it has capacity to rebuild itself. And if that wasn't enough, that overpowered organ is actually hermetically sealed by the blood-brain barrier with structures that don't even allow glucose to pass through. It needs a receptor. It, it blocks viruses. And within this closed environment, it has to be efficient in getting rid of waste and um, you know, bringing in nutrients. And in that context, what's the most important thing for this brain? By far, the most important thing is food. What, what you feed it on a regular basis, three to four times a day, can basically remake the brain, reconstruct the brain, help rebuild itself, you know, and give it the most uh, optimal energy, or break the brain and over, you know, uh, overwhelm the brain. So the meals we have, the food that we consume, literally is the most important factor when it comes to brain health. There are four processes that we've actually described in our work. In inflammation, oxidation, glucose dysregulation, and lipid dysregulation. If you really distill down all the mechanisms of the brain aging process, it has to do with these four processes. They are not independent. They're interdependent. They're connected to each other. But they are definitely the drivers of disease. And if, if, if we do the right things, they're also the drivers of reversing of aging. Yes, the brain has the capacity to rejuvenate, rebuild. And as you'll see in many studies, even things like exercise grew the brain. A brain that has the tendency to start shrinking after the age of 20 actually grew with exercise, actually grew with the proper nutrition, actually grew with meditation and things of that nature. So that brain gives you the, the chance to, to, to help it, but we have to do the work. The genetics around brain have been so overstated. Most of the diseases of aging, chronic aging, and especially the ones that have to do with the brain are polygenetic and epigenetic in nature, meaning that genes do have an influence, but it's genes in conjunction with lifestyle. When it comes to Alzheimer's, the kind of genes that actually 100% drive the disease, like in Huntington's disease, are 3%. 3%, you heard it right. 3% of Alzheimer's is driven by the kind of genes that are 100% uh, Alzheimer's related. Meaning that if you have these genes, you'll get Alzheimer's. pre one one pre and 2 and APP. The rest of the genes have to do with risk. And risk means you may get the disease, there's a greater chance, or you, you may not get the disease depending on everything else, the epigenetics, the food, the environment, the exercise, everything else you do. So, and, and the mechanism, the underlying mechanism is that inflammation, oxidation, glucose dysregulation, everything else. So for decades, we've approached uh, massive diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias like vascular dementia and stroke as though they were caused by some unusual deficiency or a lesion or an abnormal gene. And we couldn't be further from the truth. It's a multi-system process that slowly accumulates over decades for majority of these. And it's not as much as the meat and dairy and other industries would like to make it seem like, oh, it's the deficiency syndrome of the week. Oh, it's iron deficiency. It's not. In fact, we get better form of iron in, 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 in the kind of food that, that we're, we're pushing. Uh, or it's B12 deficiency or omega-3 deficiency. It's not at all. What it is, is has to do with doing away with all the poisons that we put in the food and letting clean food rebuild your brain. So, um, the, sorry. Um, now there are there there are all massively affected by lifestyle, and most importantly, one that affects the four previously process is nutrition. The most important factor is nutrition, because of the fact that when you talk about those four processes, what's the underlying driver of inflammation? Foods that are inflammatory in nature. What are the what's the underlying driver of oxidation? Fat, uh, the main driver is fat and saturated fat in particular. What's the main driver of glucose dysregulation? 
Again, fat and sugar. What's the main driver of lipid dysregulation? Well, the name says it all, lipid. Those four processes are singularly driven by food. And if we eat the proper foods in the proper manner and the proper amount of, uh, quantity, the body will give the brain the capacity to grow at any age. We've seen in studies and fMRI studies and others that people who are given the right kind of environments actually grew their brain even in their 90s, even in their 90s. So for most, uh, for more than a decade, we've been talking about the effect of nutrition on the brain health as well as age, but something that is not spoken about is the effect of food on the brain, uh, you know, at the energy level. And, 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 and most importantly, at earlier age, you know, we talk about aging process, you know, and, and the fact that the energy processes, mitochondrial processes and cells start aging as we get older. But what we don't talk about is that this process is happening throughout life. You know, during childhood, we just did a review, a very comprehensive review that looked at omega-3 and the, and the developing brain. The developing brain in the you know, first nine months and then the first few years and then later in teen years, that's when the brain is growing the fastest. So what does it need more than anything else is proper nutrition. In fact, in one study, which was shocking to us, we saw that uh, when uh, teenagers, actually preteens, uh, that had insulin resistance and had uh, uh, weight problems and other uh, problems that actually then led to inflammation, oxidation, all that, had white matter disease in their brain in their, at age 12. White matter disease that you shouldn't see till your 60s or 70s, if at all. In fact, we, we know that people who live healthfully, they don't even have all white matter disease later in life. But yet these preteens had white matter disease because of the food that they ate. So it's, it's a factor that we have to address in, in, in childhood and later life. And the only reason that we don't see it in middle life is because there's a bit of resilience that's built in that will not manifest itself or that will not show the effect of damage because it has leeway, right? But the damage is happening underneath in middle life, in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. That's when the damage is happening. You might not see the effect, but the damage is happening. So I would say one of the most important public health endeavors that we would take and we have taken it on. In fact, we currently lead the largest brain health initiative in the, in the, in the world, pretty much. Um, uh, tens of thousands of people working with us doing this nutrition and lifestyle thing is nutrition. Nutrition at any age is critical to implement. Nutritional health is critical to implement. And, uh, and uh, for that, I'm going to pass it on to Aisha to, for the first leg and then the kids. Yeah. So before Alex and Sophie start speaking, I think um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just describe the, the data behind nutrition and what we know so far and some of the, the myths and misunderstandings about food and brain health. As Dean said, nutrition matters. Um, uh, you know, nutrition is the most important environmental um, factor for the brain. It's something that we put in our body three or four times a day. So it determines the building blocks of the brain. If we eat bad food, there you go. You do not provide the right kind of uh, building blocks. And also your brain actually goes from a thrive mode into a damage control mode. You know, the, the, the whole purpose of the body's um, supportive structure is to get rid of damage. We age poorly because our protective system is overwhelmed. But imagine giving the brain the right kind of foods. It will thrive. It will grow. Um, as far as information or the data on nutrition is concerned, I think, you know, for a very long time, there was no relationship between food and brain health. We couldn't really distill it down. But then for the past 20 years, we know that food matters a lot. The one kind of dietary pattern that has been studied extensively is the Mediterranean diet. Um, and so other dietary patterns have also been studied, but it's been a very slow process. Now, we all talk, we all hear a lot about diet this and diet that, superfood this, superfood that. But when you look at the bigger picture as a society and as a nation, we're not doing very well. The American Heart Association puts out a report every year and it kind of shows us how we're doing uh, as far as the simple sevens are concerned. The simple sevens are, you know, weight, diet, uh, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, uh, physical activity and smoking. smoking. And so, you know, it shows a percentile of people who are doing, you know, who are adhering to a healthier habit versus not healthier habits. And as far as numbers are concerned, in 2020, 
last year, um, the percentage of Americans who ate a healthy diet by the American Heart Association standard, which is not really healthy, by the way, was less than 0.5%. Less than 0.5% of our nation is actually eating a healthy diet. Imagine that. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, as far as um, diet is concerned, you know, it's important to look at dietary patterns instead of specific foods. The dietary patterns, like I said, that has been studied is the Mediterranean diet. And when you break down the construct of the Mediterranean diet, you know, people usually think it may be the wine, the cheese or the pasta or the fish, but most of it is just plants. It's your greens, beans, whole grains, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables. Um, and the mind diet, which is a version of the Mediterranean diet that highlights the foods that have been studied specifically and are associated with lower risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia shows that if people focus on greens, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds, stuff that we eat on a regular basis, um, and, you know, essentially getting rid of processed foods, refined uh, carbohydrates like white rice, uh, white uh, flour, any any grain that is refined, sugary fruits, uh, sugary foods, not fruits, foods, not fruits, fruits are awesome. Um, you know, that actually gives the brain the right kind of environment to grow and thrive. Now, there's been a little bit of um, chaos when it comes to specific items like um, fish, you know, uh, fish is a part of the mind diet. But uh, we all know that fish or any animal uh, protein for that uh, for that matter is a bioconcentrator. And nowadays, unfortunately, we've riddled our oceans with heavy metals and these fish actually have a lot of mercury and uh, lead and arsenic and so many other heavy metals that we don't even we don't even Imagine. check for. So it could be a source of all of that junk that we've put in our oceans. The only reason why fish comes up is because of the omega-3 fatty acids. The only fat that the brain needs, believe it or not, it's not cholesterol, it's not saturated fats, it's omega-3 fatty acids on a regular basis. And if we consume it through plant-based foods such as um, chia seeds, flax seeds, um, hemp seeds, uh, walnuts, kale, come on people, um, you know, those can actually be a great source of omega-3 fatty acids for, for our brain. Um, but you know, if people are concerned, if, if people are not getting enough, you know, getting to the source or getting it from algae based omega three fatty acids is also okay. We're actually in the process of distilling it down. And we wrote a paper and we saw that in two population in children, and in late adulthood, when people have higher risk of cognitive decline, that supplementation with omega three fatty acids could be helpful, not for everyone, but just for some people during certain times in their lives. <laughs> such a cute little kid over there. Um, it, so so that's, that's, that's the bigger picture. Um, you hear a lot about, you know, ketogenic diet nowadays, and how that can be helpful. Honestly, you know, I could talk about the ketogenic diet for a full hour with you guys. But here's the bottom line, we don't have good long term, large, strong evidence of ketogenic diet being helpful for the brain, period. The few, far and few studies, here's the star of the show, the few and far studies that have been done on ketogenic diet and the brain were done in such small populations and in Sorry. such short period of time. It's, it's good to have Obi there when we're talking yeah. about keto diet because it's a boring subject anyway, <laughs> that it's not worth it. And you know, we're always really concerned about animal-based ketogenic diet because my goodness, I mean, giving someone so much fat, it, it, it can damage the arteries. You know, like Dean said, the brain is the most vascular organ in the body. Imagine all that fat that is consumed. It barely gets to the brain, but it for sure can damage the arteries. You know, it can cause atherosclerosis, inflammation, oxidative damage, etc. cetera. So, um, you know, being a scientist and being evidence-based, we're open to data. We're just waiting for good data to come because so far there is nothing right. as far as ketogenic diet is concerned. Nothing but, meaningful. But at the same time, there's this huge body of evidence for plant-based, whole food plant-based diet that it can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, that it can get rid of any risk for atherosclerotic disease or vascular disorder, that it could uh, modify our vascular risk factors, whether it's high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, pre-diabetes, insulin resistance. Why don't we just own that instead of looking for the new game? 
I have answers for that, but we're not going to get into that anyway. Same goes for paleo diet or any other dietary pattern. So, you know, eating unprocessed plant-based foods is the way to go. And the data is quite clear on that. I think I'm going to stop here and I'm going to let Alex take over and right. kind of you know tell you guys. So yeah, we know, you know, plant-based diet is good. We know that the Mediterranean diet essentially means eating a whole food plant-based diet. What that, how does that look like when it comes to day-to-day -day living? Do you, uh, Alex, you want to come sit? No, no, I'm good. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alex. Well, I was already introduced, but so I'll just get right into it. So um, uh, just briefly, I want to talk about the challenges or not even the challenges, just what living a whole food plant based life is like and uh, how it looks for to us. So for us, for our family, or at least I can speak for Sophie and I, because we've been planning our meal plans together since our semester has started. Um, it's, it's more than just about what we eat or the food we consume, you know, it's about like pushing the idea of healthy eating and healthy living so we don't have to succumb to like the marketing push of junk food at the vending machines at our schools or the Sabaro pizza that's right next to my classroom every single day and and part of what goes into that is first of all the decision so it's it's the decision that the plant and the and the sim single most important decision in our hand is what we put on our plate it starts with that and then it goes, and then we, we take that to the next step, which is it's more important than just the momentary pleasure we get from eating food. Because our long term health, I can promise you that the long term health that you will experience with this diet will be greater than any momentary pleasure you'll get from the best food on the planet. Here, here. Yeah. Uh, although I'm thinking of some really, really good foods right now, but still, <laughs> but still, but still, <laughs> nonetheless. Anyways, it's about living a conscious life and being aware of what you're doing, what you're putting into your body and your actions, not only affecting yourself, but your family, the world, and living a life of consequence. So uh, first and foremost, we're raised to see ourselves as not, not just consumers of, of this planet, but guardians of this planet. And that's all of us. And I know that sounds a little bit corny, but it's true. That's all of us. As soon as you wor worry about it's your- It's quite corny, but yes. it's good. It's <laughs> I good. love it. It's yeah. perfect. Yeah. But as soon as you worry about yourself, you, you worry about the world. And that's all of us right now. You guys are doing that right now by just being here. So feel good about yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Yes. sorry. And, and um, yeah, so, and yes, there are some challenges that go into it, of course, like um, e each, each yeah. week, Sophie and I have to plan our meal plans. Um, and it's a little bit difficult. It takes yeah. time, but yeah, yeah he, he had to retire from the show. Yes. Sorry about that. But yeah, um, knowing that just by planning, that the simple act of planning every weekend, mm -hmm. just knowing that that has an effect on our entire week, that in a, of itself is a form of joy. Mm -hmm. And that that actually makes the act of taking time out of your day to plan for your week and to worry about your what you put into your body and worry about your health that makes up for any time you've lost because it matters and i think that's that's the core of it mm -hmm. that's the most important aspect of all of this that's why we do it um and yeah and sophie and i now go to college so it's it's a little bit difficult at times with our commute having to balance all of that with our work um but still we find a way to do it for this exact reason because we know how important it is and obviously thank you to our parents for instilling that in us and um yeah so i'll kick it to sophie yes you want her right. to yeah. i get this seat okay i should want to sit so i guess i'll just be uh thank you <laughs> i guess i'll just uh be talking about well alex talked about some of the hardships and some like the overall of what being plant based is. And I'll just talk about, you know, day to day. So Alex and I, we both go to college and uh, we both have friends that aren't plant based. We do have some friends that are plant based, but, uh, I'll, you know, you when you encounter people in college, I mean, the majority of them wouldn't be plant based. And from our experience, personally, we haven't had that much trouble being in those kinds of environments where the diet comes up. I mean, if someone brings it up, uh, we try not to preach to them and like, give like long talks about how being plant-based is important and it is important, but we try not to be preachy in that sense. But honestly, it's not that big of a problem in our environment and we're really grateful for that. Um, 
it's also it also doesn't hurt to get into some sort of conversation about plant based diet when the person is willing to talk about it. And honestly, sometimes we actually influence our friends by our actions to consider a plant based diet at least, or considering consider a diet with healthier food. Um, for example, well, no, I won't go into examples, but I feel like you could if you want to. You could. Well, yeah, I I feel like. Uh, Sometimes when we bring some amazing foods made by uh, her. <laughs> well, you make it now, so yeah. Yeah, you but I mean, it. honestly. But it's your recipes. Your recipes. You take the credit. Thank you. We're I paid them, you. guys. Yeah, yes, yeah. We're, we're being paid. <laughs> yeah. It's a good food check. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, but <laughs> sometimes when we bring uh, food, like we cook tofu a lot. Uh, we love tofu. It's like, uh, we, we love tofu. Tofu is super helpful. But sometimes when we cook tofu or we make some like good looking food, um, people can get intrigued by it. And that could be a conversation starter, right? Um, sometimes with food, it gets a little bit more complicated. For example, like when you're in parties and, you know, there's often food in parties and, you know, dinner parties or, you know, whatever. We either take food for all of us or if we can't do that, if it's like a sudden rush thing, we can try and make accommodations. But most of the time we have something to eat. It's very rare that we don't have much to eat. And I feel like we've kind of gotten used to accommodating for it. And at first it can be a little bit, I'm not going to lie, it can be a little bit embarrassing to ask for it. And I've realized that there's nothing to be ashamed about. I mean, to uh, like being plant-based has become like a more accepted thing. And I feel like if you ask someone for plant-based options, you know, there's a, a greater chance nowadays that the, the, they will have plant-based options. Um, and also, given that our mom, as we said before, she's such an amazing cook. Um, when like people taste the food, like our friends, we ta they taste the food and they find out it's vegan. They're like they start asking questions. Like I said, it can be a conversation starter. And you know, the mere fact that it was just a vegan food that was tasty and just like flavorful and amazing, it's prompted so many of our friends to like consider a vegan diet, and you know, maybe uh, eventually go vegan or go plant based or at least take those steps. Um, honestly, more and more whole food, plant-based mm -hmm. diets and more uh, options are just being considered and being offered. Mm -hmm. and it's becoming universally available, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And one question that we get often is whether we take supplements and we do, we take uh, B12 and omega-3 because those are very important. And for omega-3, we take algae-based instead of like the fish oil. Um. Yeah. One, I don't know if I, I, I need to add on to this, but the, the, the supplements, um, we take those mainly because um, in development stages, either like when you're really young or when you're um, older, it's extremely important to have these vitamins specifically because they're crucial to brain development. Yeah. By the way, the reason he said that is because he's actually one of the authors in one of the papers and Sophie's the author in the other paper. So they, they're, uh, uh, they, they're part of the paper stuff. So. Okay. okay, fantastic. Awesome. Mom can come. All right, yes, so you can sit down now. Sorry um, for taking Thank you. <laughs> no, no, this is good. Um, we could have had a bigger venue, but we're all in our kitchen. All right, so um, so I, as a summary, I suppose, um, you know, it's, it's quite clear that consuming a whole food plant-based diet is the way to go for brain health, not just for prevention of Alzheimer's disease or other dementias like vascular dementia, um, etc. Uh, it's also very important to live a brain healthy life. And what does that even mean? Sometimes it sounds very markety, doesn't it? But it essentially means, you know, being the best version of who we are. Our brains are ourselves, uh, the way we process information, the way we uh, connect with other individuals and now around with our world, the way we remember things, the way we decide making decisions, all of these come from the brain. And you know, not to not to really to um, my field torn, which is neurology. But the reason we went into neurology was because it's so interesting how the brain actually works. And if if we continue to eat a whole food plant based diet, we won't have any trouble processing information. Our attention and focus gets better. Focus is the gateway to memory. You know, attending to something it goes awry when your system is flushed with saturated fats or refined carbohydrates or too much salt. 
you attend better, you understand better, you're able to actually have a better experience of a concept when you're given the right kind of foods. And we've seen that short term in children, long term in adults. Dean said something earlier, he said, you know, people in their midlife don't really necessarily see much. I, I kind of, uh, I want to actually add something that you do. They're just not aware that it's That's because right, of the yeah. bad food. We do see some changes. A lot of people are not able to say, for example, take on too much work, or for example, pay attention to something very well, or they get distracted very easily. And that is never really connected with the kind of foods that we're eating, but that is so true. That actually does affect the way we process things. So whole food plant-based um, diet, at the core, you know, I think especially you guys and the PBNSG team, PBNSG has done such an amazing job, you know, spreading this information over and over again to the, the to different population. But um, we're good. We're good. Sorry. We're good. Yeah. Um, but it's it's really important to um, to focus on how do you implement that, you know, um, implementation and the translation of that data in in populations and in our communities is the most important thing. Um, and it all starts with planning. It starts with planning. It starts with having an environment where you have the support structure, if not as human beings, at least a connected tribe or someone that you can refer to. And PBNSG has served as 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 a tribe uh, with regards to that. You know, not being able to cook or not liking to cook to learning one or two recipes that you can rely on on a daily basis, having a community, having a, an initiative that you can rely on. And those are those are the things that Dean and I are very passionate about. And more than just, you know, treating patients and talking to patients, we're actually cutting some time from there and uh, spending more time about creating a community that will support each other towards better brain health by implementing a whole food plant based diet and all the other factors for brain health. And um, I think I think uh, that's basically it. Do you have to say anything? No, that's it. Uh, you know what, if, if I could, first of all, everyone, amazing as always. A, a quick round of applause, and I want to thank you guys. Some questions. Thank you guys. Um, I, first of all, I'm I'm a little selfish, so bear with me. I've got a few comments and a question. First, um, you mentioned something about like, like you can't push people to whole food, plant based, and what. I was looking for is not to have people like in my world say, oh, Paul, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's really that I, making people aware of it. Like like I'm, like I'm my family is, one's plant-based, the other two uh, sons are plant aware. So, so they know about it and then they share that with other people. So I agree with uh, Sophie and Alex, you know, you can't, you can't just push people toward it. They're not going to do it. But but you're living by example, and you're just making them aware, aware of it. Uh, also, I would say that, you know, it is it is tough out there when you go buy the you know the Burger Kings, the McDonald's, all those other things. But I am living proof of the fact that, you know, you could live a long life, a healthy life, and so you don't eat that food. There's other food, and you know your taste buds will change. So so trust me, the food that that you grew up loving, like me, because I was an absolute foodie. Now, I like the food I eat. I can't say I love it, but I, I like it. But what I do love is my health. Mm. And as an organization, PBNSG really would have been big time into the planet thing. Because let's face it, humans are, we, we got to make the humans right. Because unfortunately, we're kind of selfish. And until we get us right, we're not going to help the animals and the planet. It's just my mm. personal feelings. But we only got one planet. And we have to steward this planet. We just have to, mm -hmm. one person, one day at a time. All right. Um, I also would like to just say to everybody, the way I get around it, because I don't love cooking and I absolutely despise cleaning, is I am a batch cooker. So I just, you know, if anybody wants to <laughs> yeah. send me a little note, I can tell you how I did it. And literally, like once a week, big pot, lots of soup, lots of, and I created something called tofu crumble. So Alex and Sophie, if you want to give me a shout, I'll give you the recipe. Oh, Yay. Yay. Love now, it. Um, I coined that tofu crumbles. It's great. Okay. So, so now my question is this, and this is, this is me. So what I've realized personally, and maybe you could answer, and then I've got some questions that uh, people have asked and will I, we have time. What I noticed more than anything about me 
personally is okay. I am still somewhat quick witted. I am still able to work long hours and I've got passion about me. However, I've noticed a little bit of short term memory loss where, you know, when I was walking today, I was walking. I'm a big bike rider. That's what I really do. But today it was so windy. I said, I'll go for a walk. And I got to a place where I ride all the time, where three roads cross each other. And it took me a few seconds to say, okay, where am I? And I've ridden this all, but I noticed that a little bit more recently. Can you kind of share, like I, I, I do some things for brain, uh, you know, uh, improving my brain, you know, by doing crossword puzzles and some other things. But I did, I've really noticed it in the last year. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so... <clears throat> Uh, that's why we kind of highlight the neuro, the, the five elements, nutrition, exercise, unwind or stress management, uh, unwind is stress management, increasing good stress and reducing bad stress. Um, uh, R is restorative sleep. Sleep becomes more and more important as we get older. And, and it's ju just because you got eight hours of sleep, it doesn't mean that you, you've done uh, the right thing. It has to be deep sleep where you actually go through those five, you know, through the phases four or five times a night. And then last one is optimizing mental activity that has to do with complex behaviors around your purpose. Um, and and the, all of those are important. I Sadly, it's not gonna be the one thing. Look, I mean, as uh, you are exception among exceptions, but let's take the average American. I mean, even though people come, like today I had somebody fly in from Kentucky, another per person fly in from Ohio to see us. We're kind of fortunate about that. But the first thing they said is, you know, I, I, I added blueberries to my diet. I'm like, that's the worst thing you could have done. And they're like, how is that the worst thing? It's like, it, you just told me that you, your mindset is that just adding one thing is gonna fix everything. It's gonna be more of a challenge than that. It's gonna be fun, it's gonna be rewarding, it's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be a life thing, but you will build the most important aspect of yourself, which is yourself, your brain. And it's going to take all five elements. You, um, you know, our grandparents had the fifth one, the optimizing mental activity. Brilliant, brilliant man. Her, uh, man, her grandfather was prime minister of a country, uh, um, Hopkins and Columbia trained. My grandfather was a brilliant man. Yet they died of Alzheimer's. They didn't take care of the nutrition and exercise part. Um, and so all of us have a little bit of lacking in each of these. If we take care of the nutrition, that's phenomenal. And by that, I mean, it has to be a planned, plant-based diet. We can't be magical. We, we are often uh, uh, plant-based diet and other diets and other diets are B12 deficient, omega deficient, you know, so we have to be planned and all conscious of that and check your levels and all of that. Exercise has got to be more than people think. Of course, you're an exerciser, but the average person that we meet and we live in Redondo Beach, which is a, a planned blue zone environment where they've actually created uh, bike zone stuff yet but the average person doesn't walk doesn't run you know and they, when they talk to us they say oh they i'm fine i do gardening i said that's great that's meditation that's not exercise um so it's got to be intensive it's got to tire you out and you know all of that um stress management is plan and uh, stress management is about management you know how to delegate how to reduce how to eliminate the bad stress how to identify the bad stressors specifically the fourth one is sleep I cannot tell you how important sleep is. We invest in all these spas and everything else, yet we don't invest in a dark, quiet bedroom with comfortable neck supporting pillows, with comfortable uh, bed sheets, with the temperature just right, with making sure that we go to bed in a systematic way where the brain is conditioned to know, oh, it's 10 o'clock again, the yawning starts. You fall asleep as opposed to all over the place. You go to sleep with, uh, without any stimulus up to a half an hour before sleep without any food up to two hours before sleep. Look at all these things we have to kind of be, make it part of our life so it becomes pleasurable after a while. At the beginning, it's difficult. All of us go to bed with TV on or something of that nature. So sleep has to become very, very important. And lastly, and definitely not least, mm -hmm. is mental activity. Mental activity is critical. Mental activity means challenging your brain around seven, you know, if the, well, let's take these main domains, memory, attention, visual spatial, processing, processing speed, language, I mean, and, and then idiomotor as well. That means that you have to kind of be aware of activities that take care of all of those. What is idiomotor? 
playing a guitar, playing piano, you know, playing ping pong, um, um, uh, or pong for that matter, or some, some cognitive. What's memory? Every day you're living with memory in mind. When you're watching TV, let's say the news, you watch it intentionally, meaning you're going to pay attention. That's going to focus as the gatekeeper. So everything you do focus will be at the forefront. So you improve your focus. Right now, everybody's focus is terrible. You think it's good, but it's not. The ability to knock out, block out noise and focus on an item deeply and meaningfully without falling asleep, not only not falling asleep, hyper awake for more than six seconds, more than 10 seconds, more than 20 seconds. It's not known in, in our society. So we need to get focused better and then use everyday life intentionally to build memory. If it's a show, if it's news, if it's reading, don't just read, read with the intent to see how much of it you can recall later. Then your life becomes your bare brain building activity. If it's processing speed, you were, what you were talking about was processing speed, doing things that challenge your processing speed quickly, you know, making decisions quicker, um, uh, you know, solving problems on, on, on Khan Academy or somewhere else where you have to do quick problem solving that builds that part of the brain. And if you do all of this, especially with the cognitive stuff around your weaknesses, you will actually end up doing way better than you could have ever done because most of us don't train this way. But if we start training with those kind of specific domain related life building brain activities, oh my gosh, I, I'm taking a lot of time, but one activity is I teach people one of multiple, we have this uh, brain health revolution community stuff. Uh, we teach people one multiple activities. One of them is the Roman room, which everybody knows. Pick a room in your in your house, one with lots of features. Memorize that room. Memorize it. Next, get somebody to give you a list of items to go and buy. A list of 30 items. And see how much of those you can remember without any techniques. You won't remember many. Now train yourself with the Roman room in mind. You know, you have a, a lampshade, that's a broom, you know, you, so the visuals, the color, the shapes, the location should prompt you to memorize things. And once you do that, when that one down, once that becomes natural, you naturally start remembering lists that are more than 10, more than 15, more than 30 items. Association. Association. And there are many, many other techniques that we teach and we, we go over. So I think it's critical to kind of take it a multifaceted approach. And if you do Oh my God, the power of the brain to grow is just remarkable. We have a, there's a show called um, My American Life, which is the most popular radio show on, on PBS. Two of our patients, and we can say that because they actually talked about it on, on, on the show, went there and, and at, at 83, they had significant cognitive decline and we kind of taught them some techniques. And initially they could remember lists of three or four. By the time, by in one month, they could remember 27 to 30 items. And if you, uh, you'll see in that show, they talk about this. And it, so it's these techniques that you can build your memory, focus, processing speed, remarkably more than you could imagine. All right, um, thank you, thank you. Let's go through, we got some questions. The first that was question my short answer, by the way. Paul. Well, I, I'm looking forward to your long answer, okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when you talked about omega-3, is there a specific dose that uh, people should take on? So we don't know the dose. We don't have good data on what dose actually works. Um, there is uh, there's a hypothesis that, um, you know, a lot of papers that have shown that omega-3 doesn't work was because the dose was very low. So, you know, what based on some of the data where you kind of find the threshold, it seems that 500 milligrams of DHA seems to be helpful. That's not EPA, DHA combined, just DHA 500 milligrams. So, you know, until we get more data to confirm that number, I think that's the number we go with. All right, thank you. And then um, one of the questions was, uh, there are so many types. You mentioned algae uh, to be included in it. By the way, that was a good recall for me. Um, and uh, so that's the answer. But um, the question next is to check brain health and detect any problems early. What are the tests in labs uh, would you recommend? 
Yeah, but so it, it depends. For someone who is well and who doesn't have any cognitive impairment, I think one of the things that we all have to keep a, an eye on are our vascular factors, you know, um, the lipid panel, um, making sure that blood pressure is um, measured properly, and then vitamin levels, specifically vitamin B12, B6, B1, the B complex, um, and also inflammatory markers like homocysteine, methylmalonic acid, uh, what C else is it? C reactive protein. So those are markers of vascular health. And those and should be done at A1C. least once a year and hemoglobin A1C, which shows how our um, our body is processing uh, glucose. Okay. Um, the question was sources of plant-based protein. How much is needed daily? I suppose it depends on uh, our activities, right? For, for example, if somebody's trying to build muscle or for people who have sarcopenia, which is a condition where there's muscle wasting, then, you know, eating at least a gram per uh per body, per kilograms of body weight is important. But for someone who is healthy, who's active, 0. 0.8, um, 0. 0.8 grams, 0.8 grams, right? 0. 0.7 Point, to 0. 0.8. 0. 0.7 to 0. 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So that comes down to about what? About 50, 40 An to 50 uh, grams of protein on a daily basis. You know, and, and that can e easily be achieved with Say, for example, a cup and a half of beans, maybe some hummus with some whole wheat toast, uh, making sure that you consume things like brown rice and quinoa, etc. But again, it depends on your body. It depends on your pre-morbid conditions. Say, for example, whether somebody has metabolic diseases, if somebody's overweight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, hey, just as, as a side note to everybody, you know, I, I am a big fan of um, you know, eating the fruits, vegetables, beans, whole grains, as opposed to taking supplements. But mm -hmm. saying that, um, you know, I, I was having a little bit of tingly in my fingers and my toes, bike riding. I know it's some of it's the way I hold the handlebars. Mm -hmm. So I was, I, so I said, well, I'll just, I'll have like five or six oranges. And it was, it was kind of helping it, you know, but it wasn't getting, it wasn't going away. So I actually broke down, had some vitamin C supplements and now it's gone. So you know, what I realized is an orange is 70 milligrams or whatever. I needed to have like a couple thousand. And, mm -hmm. and once I did, so again, just do your research. There's a lot of information. Uh, next question. If you take flaxseed oil recommended by an ophthalmologist for eye health, mm -hmm. is it okay to take omega-3 or replace it with omega-3s? I, I suppose so. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, getting uh, DHA and EPA in the form of a plant food, basically, so what happens is the uh, plant foods actually have alpha linoleic acid, flax seeds and chia seeds have higher amounts of uh, omega-3s. Uh, let me kind of step back a little bit. So we have omega-3s and omega-6s. These are the fatty acids. Omega threes we need, omega six we do need, but not as much, and they compete with each other. Um, omega six actually completely gets rid of the enzyme that converts the omega threes into DHA and EPA. So if we consume too much omega sixes, that actually subdues the effect of omega three, and we need omega three. Um, so people who consume plant based omega three sources like chia or flax oil. They have to make sure that they reduce their omega sixes, which comes in the form of processed foods and a lot of seed oils. You know, peanut has a lot of omega sixes. So, reducing that and eating more of flax seeds and flax oil would actually be beneficial. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Is PubMed the best place to find your papers? Um, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Google Scholar. With, with with a caveat. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, Google Scholar and PubMed. Those are uh, uh, those are places where papers that have been peer reviewed. That's important. Peer reviewed are published. Yeah. Yeah. Um, family seat. My my family's not my family, but question. My family likes Butler's soy curls. They don't eat whole food plant based. Yeah. Is this too much process, or it should be avoided? Or what would I mean, you just for a, a transition food. So, I, you know, I, I, I know the answer, really. No, you know. <laughs> no. I, you know, um, I, I, I think it just depends. Um, and that's my favorite answer, isn't it? Depends. Uh, so compared to meat and chicken, soy curls are awesome. Right. Compared yeah. to a pork, soy curls are amazing. Compared to cheese, soy curls are great. 
compared to tofu and tempeh? Probably not. It's a little processed, right? So I'd rather have people eat your tofu crumble and maybe my tempeh skewers with barbecue sauce on it rather than soy curls, right? So it just depends. It's like somewhere there in the middle. Um, but for people who are not on a whole food plant-based diet and who are transitioning, for example, or they want to try some foods from the whole food plant-based category or a plant-based category, not even if it's whole or unprocessed, I think it should be okay. You know, we work in communities where people don't even know what lentils are. I mean, I literally had to teach someone what lentils were and she was 40 years old. No blame, no judgment. She had five children. She worked three jobs and she grew from drive through to drive through and she never had a family who would cook at home and she didn't really know how to eat and she came in with stroke and diabetes and high cholesterol and so for me to tell the her to completely get rid of all processed foods no oil no sugar no salt no fries no nothing she probably will never come see me anymore right so i think it's about making small little steps and small little adjustments it doesn't mean that we compromise the optimal oh, we absolutely. always say the optimal is the health optimal. is whole food plant-based yeah. but your journey is your journey and your journey the next step is this the next step is this and and two words we get rid of whenever we start our work with people one is the word motivation because it has no denominator, no measurable thing. It's just uh, good enough for Tony Robbins and nobody else. And the second word is moderation. Moderation is a word used by men trying to get out of doing things, uh, so, uh, eating healthy. So instead of that, specific, yeah, specific, measurable, attainable, time-bound activities mm -hmm. is what we uh, set for people. You know, we've got one last question. And then I'm going to just, before I do that, I'm going to just say that like, that's why I care for Team Shirzai as a family because PPNSG, we give you the optimal. We say, this yeah. is the perfect healthy diet. And then we will hold your hand along the way. But if you get with me, like when I'm around my friends, you know, they're always wanting my approval. All my friends. Well, I'm doing pretty good today. I'm doing this. Yeah. But I'm, I'm now plateauing. I'm plateauing. That's what I hear. Yeah. I said, well, let's just take a look. I said, <laughs> you know, so I look at their salad and they're saying, well, gosh, you know, like, hey, I'm having salad, but what they're having is romaine or, or iceberg. And then it's sprinkled with a little bit of, you know, cheese on top and, and some cash, you know, some other things. And, and I just keep saying, it's like, listen, it's it's where you want, like, what do you want for yourself? Like, if you, if you want to keep getting your shot, your diabetes shot, then, you know, you're making good strides. I'm proud of you, but but, you know, it's not it's not going to you're going to keep on that plateau until you're ready to go take a few more things away. It's forward, forward, slow progress. But you are absolutely right. I don't live in these people's shoes. I don't have their issues. Mm -hmm. I don't live around food deserts. There's so much out there that they have to confront. So, you know, without judgment is the key thing. Last question. And then um, I'll make a final statement to everybody. Uh, it says, what about nuts? versus oil, peanut butter, cashews, and sauces. And, and it was funny because that was the subject my friend was talking about. And I said, real simple. I said, you know, I told him this, you guys could expand. I said, do you like walnuts and, and, and you know, and almonds? Well, you could have more of those than cashews, pistachios. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got to choose what you want more of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, because I'm not going to give you the okay to have 20 handfuls of cashews and think you're eating healthy because you won't be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When it comes to peanut butter, same thing. You know, you could have that natural peanut butter. It doesn't taste that good, by the way. But if you want to have regular peanut butter, well, yeah, it's better than eating like gobs of oil, but it's still not good. Now, I'm tough. You guys are not as tough. So go ahead. You could round that out. <laughs> yeah. If you want to say. Yeah, uh, we're a bit of wusses. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's... Um, we know we definitely believe the optimal the optimal reducing um, uh, oils as much as possible um, uh, our position on olive oil has changed a little bit um, and and it's still uh, as scientists we're okay saying that to the best of our knowledge today there's a bit of a shift and but it's minimal and at this point it doesn't serve to change your idea it's still better to be hopefully plant-based um, uh, and but that's so that's basically it and as far as nuts, if you're going to have it, have it as little as possible, making sure that um, uh, uh, you, and if you have heart disease, vascular disease or diabetes or over it, definitely almost eliminate it as much as possible. But for others who don't have those diseases, make sure that you don't go overboard with certain nuts and all nuts are not equal. The same thing as you said as well. Um, 
um, yeah, uh, um, Olive Oil story is a little different. I know that our friends are uncomfortable with us uh, when we talk about olive uh, extra virgin olive oil, but but we're not as open as people think we are with that as well. We're just saying that we're science driven and the data the data is is, is showing us a little bit of a lean, leniency, but very very little. One of the factors that has been, um, you know, really studied well and comes back over and over again is um, nutrient density and calorie yeah. sparsity. Um, even when you look at studies that look at longevity and senes senescence genes, you know, the activation or deactivation of senescence genes, which are responsible for aging, people name it, you know, something that's a little more sexy, like uh, fasting or, you know, things of that nature, but it comes down intermittent fasting. Yeah. But it comes down to low calorie foods. You know, if you consume a large quantity, low calorie food, you tend to do better. You age, uh, you, you age you know, slow, slower, your brain actually looks better. And when it comes to oil and nuts, they're high in calorie, you yeah. know? And so that is a factor that is probably adding to the uh, the bigger picture too. Absolutely. Unfortunately, we don't have clarification of this, this concept very well. We don't have clean data and it's difficult to have clean data because people don't just eat oil, right? They don't just eat nuts. They eat it in the context of, you know, vegetables and fruits. And that's why Mediterranean diet seems to come back over and over again, because yeah, they eat a ton of olive oil but they also eat a lot of greens, right? So what is, which one is working? And that's where we haven't really have had clear borders, but I agree with you. I mean, these are very high calorie foods and one should be very careful in, in, in their consumption. Well, everybody, um, I want to just, you know, I, I first of all, but here's my ask. So to um, Sophie and Alex and to Dee and Aisha, what I would like to do is, would you cordially like to come back each one individually next year and create your own one hour segment for PBNSG because each one of you has enough information. You guys are just beautiful. And I want to, I want to separate you now. Uh, so maybe, <laughs> sorry, but um, I think it'd be fun. I, yeah. So, so can I invite each one of you individually sometime next year, based on your schedule to come talk again at, the, you know, with at PBNSG, I would be honored. No doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course, Absolutely. it would be an honor. Definitely. And um, I want to just say on behalf of everyone here, me personally, um, love you. Just thank you. Aww. And it was wonderful. And uh, kids, kids, young young kids going to college. Oof. Um, uh, you got one job, school. Okay? Yeah. Okay, look at me. One job, school. <laughs> <laughs> one thing about them, they have a, a YouTube channel called The Science Kids, and they just did an amazing interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So they are there and uh, uh, check them out. For and sure. uh, I'm, I'm now advertising for them. They've written two books. The second one is about health, uh, Super Me. So check that out. So, yeah. Hey, I Dean, I saw when you started talking, your chest got a little bigger. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> it always yeah. does. Yeah. But we love you, Paul, um, love you. And, and, and the entire PBNSG team. Yeah. Um, and thank you to our lovely audience here who joined us on uh, the Tuesday night. Actually, it's 8 p.m. over there. It's kind of late for you guys. Uh, thank you so much. It was well, it's always and, wonderful and to and hang out with you. You all. guys, hook up with me whenever you can. You're, you're, you control the time. Just give me a shout, okay? We'll definitely do. Yeah, I bet you guys. Yeah. Boom, boom. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye, guys. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Guys.